All right. Welcome to the Miller Martial Arts Show. We are here for Film Sessions, Episode 3. With me are my guests, Micah the Maverick Miller. Go back, listen to the podcast, Episode 1. Matthew Waller, Episode 7. Today, we're going to be getting into my trip to Virginia Beach, Virginia, in my <laughs> second or, or third four-man tournament, where I fought twice in the same day, had a same-day weigh-in, drove a long way for me to win this $75 ringside belt. <laughs> Maybe it was 60 bucks if you had a wholesale account. Not, not a very great looking belt, but you weren't supposed to win it anyway. I wasn't supposed to win it anyways. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I, I guess, you know, we, we have already done the fir first two was my first two fights. We did a cool one where like I did my amateur debut, Micah's amateur debut and Bubby's amateur debut. And we just talked about what the experience was like for us. And so I knocked out those first two fights. Then episode two, I went over, um, my first loss on your show mm -hmm. against Daiso and like what it felt like and how to rebound. And, you know, uh, I said that, you know, it felt like a long time, but really it was only like, I think it was, what do we say? 12 weeks before I fought again. To, yeah. And if, but to me, I thought I trained like months and months before I was able to get back in there, but like, it seemed like that. And then I went back and looked and it was like 12 weeks later, I, I fought, you know, two more times. And I talked about how that loss <clears throat> against Daiso really motivated me to not only train harder, but we really, we had a plan now. We never really had a game plan. It was like, oh, just go, you know, use your martial arts to fuck them up. But with what, how we trained, I had a plan. So the big thing was I couldn't escape that guy's side mount. You know, I, I couldn't. So then we started training more positional sparring. All right, you mount him. All right, you got to escape mount or you got to escape side mm -hmm. mount or escape back mount. And that wasn't something that I recalled us doing before that until I had just gotten dominated. And then it was like, okay, we got to worry, worry, about, worry about defense. We can't just roll. We have to have objectives. And uh, for me, that was like a, a turning point was that loss. And it, it, made, it made me realize how bad I wanted this, not to make any kind of money at it, but to just be the best that I could be at it. And uh, this, these two fights that we're going to talk about was, uh, were the fights that happened after that loss. So I don't really have the best memory I have some things that I remember but like since you're here you can tell like that <laughs> let's let's talk about like the back end of it because like you were acting as my manager and a lot of people say like amateur fighters don't need managers but I know that at this time it wasn't like it was today where promoters didn't talk directly to the fighters we didn't have the social media or the access between people like we have now and I need I needed a manager. I think that still amateur fighters do need managers, and the reason why is sometimes the, the fighters wants to jump in 100 miles an hour and not know what they're getting yeah. into, versus someone who's going to have a third party perspective on it. I guess what I mean I mean a third party manager. A lot of times the the coaches are just the managers mm -hmm. for the for the amateur fighters, and that's what I really uh, meant. But yeah, you are right, absolutely. So, do you remember anything about how this fight came to be? say it was on the underground it was a it was a post it was on the underground and picked it up from there i was trying my best to keep you from fighting in georgia mm -hmm. um because i wanted you to get a lot of a lot of uh ring work outside and then shoot you right in the middle of center georgia uh, of of atlanta mm -hmm. and let you go to town because you know everybody back then we didn't have the resources to build a research fighters that we do today and so the more we could do outside of the state and that kind of stuff and, and get you in and get you a lot of work done, the more practice you're going to have, the more comfortable you're going to be in front of a crowd fighting and that kind of stuff, the better it was going to be for you in your, in your future. So I want to say I pulled that one off of um, the underground and was it MMA.TV now? It was MMA.TV. I don't even know what it is now. I don't even go there. It's still, it, was, it was called the underground when it was MMA.TV, but it's now MixedMartialArts.com. So they were, yeah, they were looking for, uh, I think it was a, it was a four man tournament. Um, but the yeah, class, but I look, <laughs> it was 135 pounds. There was, there was a very, uh, strong, you were walking at 145? 153. Okay. So for this fight. This is what I can tell you from what I remember. Uh, y'all picked me up at the house <laughs> in a van. Yeah. Um, it was my mom's van. And uh, Blizz? Was it the, uh, the maroon one? 
The maroon one. Okay. This is yeah. when Blizz and I just, we partied in the van the entire time. Um, well, get, ben is there. When you say party, give some perspective for the viewers. <laughs> like, what, what, <laughs> They weren't snorting lines in the back or anything like that, guys. I wasn't in the back that much. I don't know. Yeah. Um, no, we, we just, it was the Matt and Blizz show all the way up. And yeah. Ben, there was another guy. Too. Dylan, my buddy Dylan. Dylan, Dylan Cross. Him? Dylan, yeah, you know, his Dylan son plays baseball with, with my ben son. Did. Ben just got abused. Oh, yeah. Um, so yeah. <laughs> we drove that night, and we stopped to eat at a Cracker Barrel when it opened. And because Ben was finally able to get some sleep, he did not go in to eat. Right. He, he, he like, slept in the van. He was time to, to sleep. Um, we got there and did weigh-ins, and you had cut – you had cut – 18 pounds. So hard. We'd gone to the beach by the pier, and you were on the beach. Uh, Shadow boxing yep. with Trey. Shadow striking, like light sparring with Trey. Right? Got was it Trey? Off the scales, got back over to the hotel, and your lips were blue. I remember that. Wait a second. Was Trey Brown there, too? Was that who yeah. I. Who did I shadow box with? It had to have been Blake. Yeah, it had to have been Blake. Blake, okay. Yeah, it was Blake. Like I said, my memory is not great. So we were underneath this pier. And we were just shadow boxing and that was the, or light sparring. And that was like the first part of the weight cut, but that was the day before the fight. Cause this was a same day weigh in. Mm -hmm. So I, I had like gotten some weight down. I, I cut, I think it was like six pounds or something in that, just like that first day. And I was like, I want to conserve some energy for the weight cut, which was the same day as the fights. And I had to get down to 135, and it wasn't, plus one it was 135 pounds virginia was one of those states where it's like you didn't have a plus one or plus two and it was for this belt you had to weigh this but like where did we get the idea that i could make 135 pounds young and dumb oh yeah i can do it is that was that how it happened i'm sure it was I or mean, did somebody or did cam put that in my ear or you or did somebody say you can do it or did i say uh, i can do it you know what I, I'm going to put it all on you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I really don't know. Um, I know you were quiet all the way up. Uh, I'm sure you were focused and getting in your head and that kind of stuff. Um, oh, I was preparing for... For a war. For a hard fight. Um, Fights. Yeah, and and like I said, you got on the scales and afterwards your lips were blue. And I remember that because I remember turning to your dad and saying... I'm done. I'm, I don't want anything to do with this because I, we, I, I've never seen someone cut and that happen, and I'm uncomfortable. And I remember saying that. And I remember he came to the room and said, "Let me tell you what you're going through, blah blah blah, kind of stuff." And we were trying to get you. Yeah, he, he was had trying to wait in and fight the same. Day. Yeah, he was, and he was trying to talk to me so much, and it was like, man, just <laughs> leave me alone, bro. Like, and after we did like the shadow boxing on the beach the day before. During the weight cutting day, we, we went to the a gym, right, Micah? It was a gym. You came up with Tim, right? Mm -hmm. And we were in like a gym with a sauna slash steam room. And I had on the sauna suit, but I was in the steam room because the sauna didn't feel hot to me. Mm -hmm. And we went into the steam room. And you know how like that's the humid heat. Mm -hmm. and it was super hot. And I was shadow boxing and jumping rope inside of it. And the heat was just unbearable. At one point, you were there, right? During that, all that? The weight cut? Yeah. Yeah. So what do you remember about that? Not a lot. <laughs> like, Not a lot. I do remember Blake. I can't, I don't, Blake says I passed out, but I don't remember passing out, but I do remember Blake dragging me out. Um, I, like I said, I remember, this wasn't my first rodeo as far as cutting weight, but this was the first time that I had seen all these things happen during a weight cut that I was uncomfortable. And that's yeah. when I said, I'm out. Like, I don't, I'm not making this call anymore. This is on you all. And, <laughs> and I didn't know anything about diet and nutrition and cutting weight the right way. It was just all in my head. And I was like, mm -hmm. I can do anything. And that's it. Anything. Mm -hmm. So if you're telling me, like, this is the weight and I got to cut 18 pounds, I can cut 18 pounds because I'd, I'd heard about guys cutting more than that. Now, I didn't yeah, have a... They were like 220. Right. And they had 
eleven percent body fat or something like that. And but I was like, yeah, yeah just more more muscle in the frame, right? And so I was like, pull I water out of. So this is one of the most dangerous weight cuts I ever had, you know. And it's one of the most dangerous I've seen. That's what I'm telling you. Is is I was I was uncomfortable and nervous about it, and I'm glad your dad was there because that's when I said I'm out. Yeah, I know that you guys wanted to pull the plug and like send me to the ER. And my dad, because <laughs> this was the same day fight and weigh in. Yeah, and my dad was supposed to have IV bags and had the bags. Yeah, this he was, was the heartbreak. Right. This was he the heartbreaker. Went to a vet. I but, think he but went to this a was vet's. the crusher. He forgot the catheters. Yes, something. The, yeah. Either he forgot the tubing or he forgot the catheters. He went to. I, I was in the he, car with him, and he went to like a vet's office or something, trying to <laughs> trying to get them to. Like, so, buy but like that was kind of something that was like helping motivate me. Was I was I was uh, promised. It, I know it sucks now, but you're gonna get an IV and you're gonna feel so much better. And so I, I get. I remember getting on the uh, at the weigh in. The weigh in was not like it was like in a room. I remember a lot of orange juice being orange juice. Yes. Like, I, and I man, I can taste. You, you don't even know what orange juice tastes like until you're on the verge of full dehydration <laughs> and death. You, the citrusy taste is so uh, magnanimous when you're that close <laughs> to just complete kidney failure, and you sip. It's the greatest glass of orange juice. you Because we kept getting more and more. I remember just how much orange juice can you drink? Yeah, and I was drinking OJ <laughs> and blue Powerade, and I remember. Uh, Maybe that's why his lips were blue. Wait a minute. No, I'm not. <laughs> but like I was in the the bed, like you were saying, and it was like I was cold. I guess I was like hyper or hypothermic. Yeah, Whichever yeah. One, one, I cut so much fluid that my body couldn't hold, couldn't keep itself warm, and so when I got to the hotel and my dad was like, "You need to hydrate," and I was just shivering. I was I was like, I just wanted to get warm. So I, after he told me like, "You need to drink liquids," I couldn't drink the liquid because you you don't buy lukewarm Powerade at the store. <laughs> you know, you you're, you're, you buy like cold Powerade, and mm-hmm. it was like too cold. So I ended up running a hot warm a warm bath for me to get in that so I could drink the power so i'm in this this uh bath but it's really just to regulate my body temp and so i'm drinking this powerade and i and i was hungry too i was really hungry and i was thinking that my dad's like you need to you need to be pounding the fluids and i was like i need to be having an iv right now (laughs) (laughs) you know um what do you remember about like i just remember i remember that the most i remember the sinking feeling that like he dropped the ball so hard yeah. And just, the, it just, it was kind of like somebody died. Because <laughs> it was like, <laughs> oh my God. Like, that is a whole the, new level. The, the bummer. Just watch my just brother like, die. <laughs> no, like, like somebody died. Like, it was like, okay, we were, this really went wrong. And like, we just have to process this for a second and just realize that we're going to have to move forward under the, really unideal circumstances. It was the punch in the face. Mike Tyson said that. Everybody's got a plan to get punched in the face. So, plan went wrong. I I was like angry. (laughs) I wasn't like, you know, like he's saying like everything went wrong. That And and because you guys were looking at me and you could see how close I was, but I was sitting there going, fucking fine. I'll just do it without an IV then. I wasn't even like thinking like this was going to affect my performance like to this level. I was like, now it's just got to be a little bit harder and I got to earn this with, I was like, I was triggered. I wasn't like, uh, thinking like now I won't have the IV. I was like, you never had an IV before. Well now you don't get to have it for the first time, you know, like, so I was more like, more like that. But, uh, well, it's good to use stuff like that to fuel you. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, like I said, I, I really thought that I could do anything in the world. Like you couldn't tell me that I couldn't achieve this or that, especially when it was something that was like, you know, if I can't beat somebody, you could tell me that, I guess. But it's more like, show me. Mm-hmm. Show sh- maybe that guy's better than me, but show me. You know, but if but you couldn't tell me that I couldn't physically make that weight. You couldn't tell me that I couldn't fight that same day you know these are things i can do because i felt like that was all on my shoulders but uh let's talk about the field for a minute this guy you guys can see on the screen is nick catone um he was like uh <clears throat> he's a, a wrestler and he was like multiple time naga expert division champion and i i guess that he was the favorite yeah you were definitely uh you were definitely the minnow thrown into the shark to uh, 
to get eaten up on him. That way he could go to the next. From what I yeah, from what I remember looking back, yeah. at it, it was going to be an easy move for him to go to the finals. Right. I'm not sure if they, did they do a draw. Do they do they draw names that day or I can't remember how how it can't no because like I one thing I remember is that I think it was Blake and Ben or it was Blake and Mike and Ben who who did you stay with my dad okay so it was Blake and Ben and they didn't know that I was still awake but I could hear them talking <laughs> the night before. And like, you remember how like emotional I got after this, this fight uh, or not. Yeah. This fight, this uh, event um, was because like, I remember listening to them talk about how like they weren't sure if I was going to be able to pull it out because of how good this guy was. So it's like, and I don't fault them for that. Like, cause you don't know. And it's okay to be nervous for the people you yeah, care but, about. Yeah, but, but like, you'd rather go outside the hotel but, room. But you know how, <laughs> yeah, but it was like real, it was like real late and I just couldn't sleep because of like what I'm putting my body through and because I'm just like preparing for war and like I could hear them talking about it and it was like, even my corners got me out of it. Yeah. <laughs> and, Jesus. I, and I was like, I didn't know anything about that. So I've never really said anything about that. Cause that would, that would be really disheartening to have I brought these guys in to, to be back my core and, <laughs> and you guys are going to be in the trenches with me and y'all are already going eh. yeah but <laughs> what like, time's the beach open but but <laughs> I mean, no but like ben, ben was always like that for everybody he yeah. was always nervous like but I think this is the I've always thought of Ben being like the calmest person no no yeah Ben Maybe is like ben. Ben's always like I don't know if you can do it like to your face like <laughs> <laughs> but this, but he was not like that. I've never seen him do that. <laughs> this was like the beginning of that. So like, and, and Blake and, and, you know, he did that with me with Brian. Yeah. Like, I don't know, man. He's really good. <laughs> <laughs> Why did y'all keep bringing Ben? He's definitely not. He's a good man. It's, 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 it's not like, it's like a he, shot at you hey, though. He it's, was down for that squad. Yeah. He's a teammate, a loyal teammate. He just he do anything. Him, like, hey, he'd do anything hey, for you. It's, it's like just the, he's nervous. By him letting it out, he would feel better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but did, did anybody just ever tell him just I don't need to hear that? Yeah. You can think that all yeah. day long, but I just don't need to hear that before we move forward. He needed to share it with somebody. I, yeah. <laughs> go go talk to the people on the street, but I need your back in my play hundred miles an hour while you're in here. Like you're an animal, you're a beast, you're gonna get this. He was just like, Ugh. Yeah. It, but this guy was expert naga champ he was a uh, a wrestler uh i tried to look up some stuff on the internet i think the the he placed sixth or something like that in a, whatever state he was from which was jersey i think and um he was just a stud and you know yeah the i, I don't remember that part the funny thing is is i ran into him about six years ago really at a grappler's quest and they did this uh they did this like fan expo, um, UFC fan expo. That's where I grappled Jim Miller in like this super fight, but he was in like the regular people tournament. He grappled that day. I went over, like took a photo with him, you know, just BS about, you know, the old days. It was really cool. But, uh, I was, I was like outmatched. And so to be able to overcome just like the weight cutting how mis I, I can't even say how miserable i felt in this weight cut and, but i i fucking made it i made 135 on the dot when two days before i was 153 and i fucking did it and i had nothing but powerade orange juice and fucking spaghetti that motivated me to you look like death fight in this fight you look like dust was holding each other together so let's check this out guys so, Cooter, should I do this without volume or with volume? Without. Okay. All right. <laughs> I just had it in my mind. I'm going to run at this. So, like, whenever that you get. a cam attack. Yeah. But, like, I was coached to, like, hey, you know, let's go. Let's, like, throw some head kicks at this guy, push kicks, keep this guy away, a little short little fucker wrestler he wants to take you down he's the expert grappler he's the naga national champ and so i just said fuck that i was like let's get this over with <laughs> that was my mentality i don't need to find out over eight minutes or well, 12 that's, that's or 15 the, who the best fighters goes back let's to find out right mentality. fucking now to get it over and done fast so i can retain enough for the next round for the next bout yeah so <laughs> 
I just sprinted this guy, and I wish that I could have had a Jorge Masvidal type front flying knee knockout, but he just moves off to the side. God, that would have been. <laughs> well, <laughs> and then he just quickly double legs me. And wow. Triangle, switching back to the arm bar. The arm bar causes him to posture, um, or, or he postures the guy out of the triangle. You switch to the triangle arm bar, which makes him come back down. And so you can just see how tight this thing is, but there's some space, and he's just going full spaz. And I'm squeezing as hard as I can. And I know that when somebody starts punching you, that that's, that, usually the that's <laughs> almost over. But I'm all the way on my side, so look how close he is to escaping too. He's got his leg completely over my head, and he taps out, and there goes the camera. There's Blake and Waller somewhere around here, too. There he is, forehead to forehead. <laughs> yeah, and, like, I'm just that was, like. That was about the time of that picture, wasn't it? I was, like, boo-hooing, you know. It was, like, super emotional just because, like, I was. It was, like, all that hype for that for 36 seconds of But it fighting. was over and done the least amount of damage as possible. Yeah, flawless victory, but uh, to a guy you were supposed to get uh, just fed to, right? So that was that was the big big thing for me. So then you wonder what the, your opponent next was thinking. Yeah, <laughs> if they had done the research, if they went to the finals against Nick, so, they were in the back watching because you know that's what everybody would do. They would watch. Oh yeah, I'm fighting the winner of this. Right. And oh I, my god! And after <laughs> this, I, I watched the next guy's fight. So the setup for this is a. It's one that I will, I will get even on a good black belt, even today. Yeah, I call it the thread the needle where you just <clears throat> you get on your hip, like with the overhook or control of the head, you get the far wrist and you just push it out and you just like thread the needle and you put it mm -hmm. in. Well, there's this one that whenever a guy takes me down and he tries to shoot past my guard and he actually passes my frame, my knee, he, he passes it. But I take the wrist and I actually push it to his hip. I don't push it out. So it, he's already knee cut through my guard. It's not an official pass. He hasn't controlled the position for three seconds but see he hits a underhook over here so i have an overhook and he hits a knee cut and i've got his wrist and i pin it to his own hip so i'm pushing that and now i'm shrimping the opposite way i'm shrimping upward while i'm pushing him downward and i make a frame on his own hip with his own wrist and so he'll be past my guard and then i'll be in guard but mm -hmm. now i'll have a triangle so it's a really cool crafty uh, setup that's not one you want to bait somebody with but when they shoot past you if you had the wrist control you can hit their hip and you can use that to make yourself go backward and uh it's an oldie but a goodie but yeah you just and i was on the camera here not prepared to have that, you sprint you to have, yeah to have you sprint like that <laughs> 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 and so most of the time you're on your back. You can see I'm all I was all the way on my rib cage. This is where it locks up. I'm triangle, triangle arm bar. And he's just this could not have been how he expected things to go. Yeah. But I'm I back on my side here, and that that tells you it's pretty tight. But uh It is always that like you were saying, that flail punch though. It's like the Hail Mary is being thrown real quick. Is something might happen real quick and and it doesn't. Yeah. Good referee, Rick McCoy. Um, black belt jiu-jitsu I went and did a seminar at his school you know a while back but that that's what that's what we love man the, the team and the squad you know jumped in there a lot of people traveled so it was cool knew you'd do it the whole time <laughs> always had faith in you <laughs> yeah <laughs> was, that, was that Ben <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that was cool um, so I was I the I wasn't the first fight of the night but I was pretty close to the the early part because it was a tournament because they had to and they wanted to show who you were they had a 170 pound one going on as well this guy mikey gomez uh i think ended up winning that one um i think that he later fought blake barber or somebody like that maybe, maybe that sounds maybe, familiar maybe not yeah uh i don't know i'd have to go back and find out for sure but um so preparing for the second fight i'd already fought in three this is my third four-man tournament i think by now you're already in the back pounding yeah. orange juice again yeah and i'm staying chill i remember you gave me a, a, goo. a gel goo it was the yeah, first yeah. time i'd ever found out about that because i tried to eat a bar like a like like a cliff bar like just a something oak, to ingest quick but I, my body didn't want to hold on to it and now that i know like 
the way that we rehydrated and refueled and, and the circumstances was just all off. But like my, my belly was rejecting solid food. I had one bar and couldn't eat anymore. And you're like, dude, chew some gum. You got to do something to like, and the gum made me feel like I was uh, hydrated. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, even if you're not, it's going to feel like you are. Because mm -hmm. if I wasn't chewing, I could feel like the chap lips feeling like the dry That's cotton people mouth. people chew gum in saunas also. Yeah. Or Tara LaRosa used to always put ice in her mouth. Yeah. Just hold it in her mouth and she'd spit it. So it's cold here. Mm -hmm. Cool Tara LaRosa story. So she moved down to <laughs> South Florida a little bit. Um, uh, I think she had some personal stuff going. So she moved to South Florida a little bit. She was training with our little... Uh, ATC affiliate team mm -hmm. um, in Boca where McCarthy had his school and me and Micah and, and Blake we were we were running that place and she always wanted to be treated like a guy oh yeah yeah and she threw a left hook like a guy so when I sparred with her I sparred with her like a guy and blood would be all over her face but she was, her cool with with she was like, cool with it she was down, <laughs> down for it I just remember a couple of times like Blake going hey man like do you think that was necessary? And I was like, <laughs> she was beating my ass. I had to do something. When we say anybody can get it, that's what that's what we mean. <laughs> no, she she was definitely one that paved the way also for women. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, no doubt. But I was in the back, pretty calm. So like the first time I ever fought since that my first experience was a tournament, and it was like uh, most people don't have that that their first fight is a tournament. But uh, this was like par for the course for me now so i was used to being go to the back stay calm calm down don't do a big warm-up stay focused on the prize relax lay down don't get back there and don't keep hitting pads and hyping yourself up and going up and checking out the fights i watched this guy fight whoever he fought they fought a decision so it went at 15 minutes in virginia their amateur rules was the same as pros so we had access to elbows we had access to the five minute rounds um, they didn't. I remember them going to the distance because I thought, okay, this is good. It was great because he he was burning his tank up. Right. Meanwhile, you had a thirty second fight. Yeah, I had a thirty second fight. I didn't have much of a tank, but I didn't know that either. Like, I can go forever. You couldn't tell me that I, that this weight cut had an effect on me. Shh. But just look at the height. You couldn't really see it in the first fight because I sprinted so fast, and then you were off camera. Then we're in a triangle choke and on the ground. You can't really tell the difference, but here is pretty clear to see. So let's uh, let's get into it. Oh, high kick. That hair. And low kick. I threw a low kick and it still went over his head. Let's check that out again. <laughs> that was pretty pretty cool. Whoa. All right. No surprise there. I got taken down. Guy Rutt was a college wrestle, wrestler. He wrestled for Old Dominion University. Got up really so fast. I got up and then did some kind of sidekick thing. But And I remember, like, if we crank the volume up, I can already he hear uh, Matthew calling for the triangle. Like, he's like, the triangle's there. Not this instant, I mean, when, but when just you were built like you. I mean, it was like, <laughs> yeah. You should build a triangle across the ring. And then you were like, tell me to take his back too, and. And the guy was built like Scotty the Body Johnson. I mean, he's. Yeah, he was built like that guy. And yeah. there it is. There's the beginning of the end, and just lock on that choke. But that was always your go-to. Oh so yeah. Anytime that, anytime you would see that, you were thinking. We just got seconds now. Let's go ahead and. Yeah, we talked about how I was good at the things Cam was good at. Um, I had a good triangle choke at the time, and I threw some good head kicks and stuff. And I fought like how Cam trained me to fight. Except for you didn't do the poor man's triangle there. No. Yeah. Well, the regular one worked. All right. Yeah. Taking pictures with the ring car girls. There you go. <laughs> you want me back at my place when I rehydrate again? No, I got to look tough for one. <laughs> I'm going back. All going right. Back to crash now. I'm done. All right. Yeah. Seventy-five dollar ringside belt. Full contact fighter gear. But what you put in like a total of maybe two minutes? Yeah, something something like that. And there's the big difference in height. Man, just skin and bones. <laughs> Hell yeah. Micah focusing in on the belt, the gold. Yeah. 
Yeah. Cool, so are you cool, gonna? The cool big moment. question is, are you gonna defend the belt? <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't think so. But um, same day. Same day. So I went through all that torture and um, fought. You know, made the weight, cut the weight, fought the, the twice in the same day again, and uh, we did. We did what we were supposed to do. You took the least amount of damage you possibly could in both fights, though. So, if my kidneys would have taken just as much. <laughs> they, now they have um, those buses that pull up, and they'll just rehydrate you right outside. Who have does? You seen those? Like Atlanta? Like, yes. Like where you can party out and drink. And then yes. Make, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard about that. So you can just rent one of those to show up to weigh-ins. I'm gonna go sit in the party bus for a minute. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the recovery bus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they have a uh, hydration stations. That's what they're called. Yeah, you so, just go to one of those. I remember like the 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 ride back was so fulfilling, and even going out that night on the town in Virginia Beach. Wait a minute, the ride back we went to. What's the Mexican place? We stopped at the firecracker place, and, and we got a. We were in a high speed chase. What? You don't remember that? <laughs> what are you talking about? A high we were, speed chase. We were, in a, we were in a chase with some people there. Who was driving? Was it Blake? Blake and he, I thought it was you and Blake sw- swapped off. It was, it was definitely Blake when it happened, but somebody had upset someone and we were. Oh, yeah. They were he chasing high, he us. He high, hightailed out of there. Yeah. It they was were like, like a, a Mexican gas station firecracker. Uh, it's the big place with the sombrero outside of it. Um, yeah, and it says like we sell fireworks. I'll yeah, but it's like a, there's a lot of stuff there because yeah. I had to go up recently to a, a race in that area, and I stopped in there just went and walked around. <laughs> there's like a little like uh, exotic animal area, and it's like a. And we stopped at Cracker Barrel on the way back. Also, did Ben go in to? Uh, I can't remember. It was like to mess with the, the waitress, um, <laughs> and then but I actually got to eat at that one, and then uh, <laughs> and then um, can't eat here. But when we went when we went out uh, that night on the town, uh, Sherry, uh, the bitch Thompson. Yes, she was she was there cornering another guy from Georgia, from the Atlanta, LA boxing or velocity kickboxing, whatever they were calling it back then. The guy ended up becoming like one of the main coaches for the Muay Thai program there. I, I just forgot his name, but I think he did a Thai fight uh, that that day. If they had it, I might be incorrect, but he was a kickboxer and he fought and we rendezvoused up with uh, her and them. And he had won too. And we were just like kind of hanging out, uh, eating at the pizza joint. There was like a pizza joint that we went out, out and, and got food at. So that was uh, some pretty cool memories. Then we started just like uh, messing with Bubby the whole time about some stuff. That oh, I do remember that. Basically like, Triangulation. Yeah, we, we were talking about the cell phone triangulation <laughs> that uh, uh, Steve Hedden was going to cu- come and just yeah, tape or something. Come get, yeah. Yeah. So it, uh, some, fu- some funny times. <laughs> but uh, I just remember like, when the when we got this bad boy right here and the work had been done, it was uh, very fulfilling to but be see, able to do that. And that's how that's how memories are made, though. That just sparked all those memories from there. Yeah, so. yeah. I still really don't remember uh, like weight. the training camp for it. Now the weight cutting, I remember. Like I said, I was in in that steam room for you, forever. You were uh, part of the Pain City Boot Crew, so every day was a training. PCBC? Yeah. I was not. I was more of an honorary member of the PCBC. <laughs> so every day was training for you. I was, I was more like a, a a fan of the PCBC. <laughs> I wasn't actually indoctrinated into the, the group. <laughs> oh, my God. That was, yeah, I remember um, quite a bit of that trip. That was a lot of fun, though. I can't remember the name of that little Mexican... I don't know either. It's like a it's like a famous little. It's on the side of the road. So that that was the first time that my dad had met Blake, <laughs> and and Blake had this hat. It was a UFC hat, but it said "Upstanding Fucking Citizens." Yes, I remember that. Group. And like, <laughs> he was like talking to somebody, like about how he didn't want that guy Blake hanging out with his son or some shit like that. <laughs> Because Blake just shows up with the trucker hat that says, like, <laughs> upstanding fucking citizens on it, which was a forum, you know. But he was a big name on that forum, though. Yeah. Is it still around? No, but uh, Blake said there's some sort of FBI yeah. raid that <laughs> shut the, the whole forum down. Like, the FBI shut the internet down, and the, the people who launched it got taken down in some kind yeah, of sting. Yeah, 
Yeah, Blake Blake got out in time. <laughs> oh my god! But uh, I went there a few times. It was it was definitely a different. Um, it was not the the UFC. Yeah, so. yeah. So, but Blake came, Ben, uh, Dylan, Dylan. I Mike forgot came. Dylan was there. Yeah, I didn't. He was a quiet I, one. I came. Like, I, I came late. Up. The day of the fight, he was gone. Like he had left the hotel room and went to watch monster trucks or something. What? Yeah, there was like a monster truck thing or something down okay. the road, and he he like had dipped out, like and just went to go watch that or something. And we we're like, he's a, he's a really he good quiet. He's a really good friend, and you know he wasn't training with us. He just wanted to go like support. At but the did time. he look at you and say, I don't know if you got this or not? No, or, or did no, he say like, man, you got this? I don't, you know, I don't remember him. Look, like, because he wasn't really around during Keith the weight cutting. Keith Sweat carries a great hype man with him. Who? Like, who? Keith Sweat. Y'all know who Keith Sweat no. is? No. Okay, he's a singer. Okay. How old are y'all? Okay. So, so, like, I work center, at the Center Place Auditorium, um, and he comes through there. He's got this little hype man, and he's just out in the crowd, dance. That's okay. not Ben. That would be Dylan. That would be Dylan. But D- Dylan, but Dylan. I don't think we really like that. No. no. I don't think that Dylan was like that either. Dylan just was loyal. No, I don't think we really like that. Like you and I, don't, have no, never we don't been, like the hype. I've never man. been people that but need, uh, you like need really the, even you want don't need the, the anti hype man. hype man. You don't need Ben in the parking lot going, "Don't come see Keith <laughs> oh, Sweat." Oh yeah, tonight, yeah, tonight yeah. the show sucks. Yeah, we need we we need uh, if, if we're gonna have a Ben, we need a Keith Sweat fanboy also. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Just but, neutralize it out. But. Dylan just wanted to show the love because yeah. he wasn't really training. He ended up training a little bit later. He, yeah, he did a little. Uh, bit. Just did a, some naga. Yeah, he did yeah. some nagas, and, and uh, even when he got, you know, he joined the navy. He got stationed in um, Japan for a little while before he got stationed at Guantanamo, and um, he continued his training in Japan. You know, really, really kind of more like uh, he went to a club team, but then he started kind of like working with some guys just on base. So he, he kept it up for a little bit. Now. Um, his son is on my son's t-ball team which is cool because i played baseball with dylan growing up you know that's how i knew dylan okay and um <clears throat> and it's funny because i'll tell people left and right that you know oh yeah i'm, I'm the mixed martial arts but blah, blah, blah. and oh you know cole miller he played baseball i didn't know you were fa- i didn't know you were that famous for the baseball thing around. i'm not famous for baseball. <laughs> everybody knows you not but, for the fights but for baseball but i played a lot of baseball they know you from the baseball yeah i wasn't good enough to be famous from it um but dylan a cool thing about Dylan is he became, he finished second, first runner up at the World Series of Beer Pong. It was actually like shown on ESPN2 or something like that. Really? And, and it was like a big tournament. And he got, his team finished second place one year. That's a cool little like, uh, a lot of people, that. like, they think that Middle Georgia doesn't have like a lot of uh, cool people or done a lot of cool things or it's like a small town. They always want to go to Atlanta or move away. And if you need that for your personal growth, that's cool. But I think one of the coolest things about middle Georgia is the people. And that there's a lot of people who do have a lot of knowledge or a lot of specialties or have made a lot of cool accomplishments and being world series of beer pong, uh, runner up and having made it to that's ESPN. On my <laughs> so like at the world championships, it was in Las Vegas, Nevada. That's pretty cool. Did they fly mm-hmm. him out or he had to pay? Was I'm it like, not sure. did he have to turn the boot at the end? He might've, he might've, he might've had to have a sponsor or something like that. Do you, did he train for this? I need yeah. to know. Yeah. You like, train and, and you do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're really? athletes, Matthew. I, mean, I, don't, I don't know. I didn't even, well, I didn't even know this was a thing. Well, they yeah. have their own league and everything. I played beer pong one time at, uh, Kathy Provo's garage. Yeah. Uh, with Chris Pratt and Susie and them. And I was just like, I don't want to drink the beer. It just landed on the concrete. Yeah. The ball. And then they'll throw it in the beer and they will trying to get me to drink the beer. And I didn't want the beer. With who? Well, then we started, I think we started putting water in the cups. So I didn't know you train, you could actually train for beer pong. But there, I have been to the video game where they have they, what's the place? Uh, Pinstrikes, and they have a beer pong game. Huh? I didn't know that until recently. It's like a little, it's little red solo cups, and you have to throw it in there. The more you know. Yeah, I just went bang down on you. Like <laughs> another cool thing about <laughs> one more time. about this fight is because it was the first. I know it's two fights, but the first fight that uh, I fought coming off of that loss, it was cool to see. Cause you know what I wanted to do was fight that evening that I lost after I lost I oh, yeah, to yeah. fight, get that over with. So even though like I thought that it had been like eight months, you know, it was only 12 weeks or whatever. It felt like an eternity to me. And 
to believe in the training that I was doing and to see the growth in that short amount of time and to, despite doubt from some other people and even like having to go through like that turmoil to get to that, that weight on that day and fight twice in that day and to be like the iron man of it coming out, but to more to be like, uh, re-solidify myself and to assure myself that what I was doing on the path that I was going, that I was doing the right thing. That was very important. It was very like a confidence builder having lost that fight and not only lost, but getting smoked in my hometown in front of everybody mm -hmm. after I was being built up. Like I was rookie of the year for team practice or Academy of the fighting arts at the time. And then to lose like that, but then to bounce back like mm -hmm. this, that was huge for my confidence. Did you ever follow up with the other guy? The second guy you fought? As no. As far as what he's, what has he done afterwards? No. I mean, I think totally I think that I've, right looked, I've looked at looked him up or a couple <laughs> times. Maybe he fought, maybe he didn't. I don't recall, but uh, but um, you know, I don't like, know. Yeah, I just can't. I can't hang with this guy. Yeah, so you, you shut somebody down. Is what you're saying? Maybe, maybe so. <laughs> That's the game. It's the name of the game. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes you shut them up. Sometimes they're they're chill. Sometimes you retire somebody, and sometimes they retire <laughs> yeah. you. Yeah. You know, like, what, what do you want? Oh my god! But uh, you should reach out to him. The guy Blake Romano, yeah, the, second, the yes. second guy. See, see what he's up to. Just say, hey, we just did a podcast on you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but you know what? what <laughs> you know what's cool about the fight for them too is that they didn't take a lot of damage. Like, I threw that high kick at that dude's dome, and then I threw a low kick that he ducked under. I'm sure he could feel the wind on that shit, and he was like, "I need to get the." These guys, because they were, I was 135. I'm six foot one at the time. But the discs in my neck are so great, so I'm every bit of six one and a half. You know. <laughs> yeah, but you were you were kicking them across right. the ring. Yeah, I mean, exactly. So these guys were like, I need, we need to get close. But so neither guy wanted to strike with me. Like down street fighter. They were both grapplers, so it's that was a good thing for them too, <laughs> is that they didn't take too much damage. So you were concerned about them, is what you're saying? No, I'm just saying to look back at it from their perspective they did get tapped out they did get owned in under two minutes each but neither one of them got fucked up you know so that's good because they can go out and keep fighting i didn't like rearrange somebody's orbital and like end them today you know because <laughs> we've seen things like that happen. i was gonna say uh, there was a guy for, involved free. Also. for free for free for free for free that that day that that dude's uh that's this, exactly what i was gonna yeah in Dude, also yeah, that was we, we talked we, about that. we heard that it was like a crack and like we a like, wooden baseball bat. What was that in. noise? And the next day they said he was driving home chewing gum. And he felt his whole... Dude, we could see it in the locker room. I didn't know that. They I didn't laid, know that part. They, they laid him down because he was in shock. But did, who did it? Was it Andy Foster? No. Somebody, I don't know who it was, but they kicked him and it landed. It was, mm. And it was the name of the fracture. It was a, It's a certain name. But that's there's that and there's... You know, everybody always says, oh, oh uh, break the arm, break the arm. But I was in... Columbus and someone someone had they had thrown him and he he posted out and it had to have cracked a little bit there and then they, they caught him and he moved the wrong way and you heard it and it sounded like a like a tree branch and you heard pop and it was really quiet inside there a little bit like that and um like everybody's screaming for the guy and the guy screams and everybody's screaming it was just so you don't want to hear that stuff you want to see it you want to see a good fight, but you don't want to see someone just maimed like that. Yeah. Who was the guy in Valdosta? Dude, I don't know. We can pull up the event and probably track it down of who it was not and kind of narrow it down. Was it a Corpus fight? No. It was either Corpus or Richard Cox. It was Richard Cox's because I never fought on one of Corpus shows. God knows. I remember hearing that. Yeah. That was rough. Wait, but mm. but then now I, like my brain is not quite there. Was this the one that McCarthy and Ken Nitro and me and Trey fought, or was this the one? No. I, this no. was the other one where Cam fought like Tim Stout that night. Yes. Okay. Because that was at the. That's right. Yeah. Okay. One was at the pig barn. Yeah. One was at the agricultural pig barn. Yeah. And one was at the actual event center. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> one, the one event center was where it happened. One smelt like manure, and one was indoors at a very I nice. I told place. everybody I worked. And one was manure. From a pig barn to a UFC. <laughs> I've done it all. <laughs> yeah, that was. Yeah, I remember that. One Ooh. one crazy thing about this uh, this event that I see now, looking back, like as an adult, it's like 
he mentioned that you were being fed, right? You like, because how much more experience th- did this guy have, Nicotone? Like, I, dude, I've been training. Stud. That, I've been yeah. training yeah. nine months or That's something what I mean. like that. Like, yeah, ten yeah. Months. he was. He was. I think that. I mean, you know, when you have a tournament, you've got someone you can look at and go, okay, uh, this guy's probably going to take this out and, and and win. And Nick was definitely that guy on paper. But you, I mean, you don't ever know what's going to happen until the bell rings. But on paper, Nick should have won that whole format. Yeah. And I just find it really, uh, really interesting, like looking back with the experience that I have under my belt now being older, just to see like how somebody like like Cole with the lack of training that he had can really beat someone so easily. You know what I mean? And go ahead. I'm sorry. Like, like I think the I think and it goes back to when when you look at the the training aspect that we had. We train for fighting, you yeah. know, and I think looking back, I think that plays a really big role in how well he did, how fast he did going against guys who, like you said, like a, a tearing it up on Naga and maybe doing having some skills in, in these certain areas that you need for fighting. But we trained for fighting and that was like primary. And I think that combined with the kind of mindset that Cole had. That's where I was going with that's the mindset. like when you put those together, like it, it, now I, I can kind of like now I can kind of make make sense of it older, but man, it's like it, it's impressive. You know, well, it's, it's really impressive to be able to to, to to do that to somebody that has such a disparity in the training. You know. Yeah, th- that's what we were talking about earlier. As far as uh, you, know, you might have a guy that didn't have that much skill in it, but he if how much heart he has is what's going to be the difference. Yeah. So, how much can he can he uh, go through and pull out? If he has a little bit of knowledge, what's going on? And he was definitely hungry for it. I mean, he told you just in on, on you know, weighing in that kind of stuff. Oh, I can do it. I can do it. You tell me I can do it. I can do it. Well, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, he's always had that uh, that heart and that drive. He never wanted to be better than anyone else. He just wanted to be the best he possibly could. Mm-hmm. So that definitely made a, a huge difference uh, in impact on that fight. And like we were talking before about like Cam's confidence in us, mm-hmm. like. I felt like I was like Cam's like little prodigy that he was like molding. And oh, I yeah. I looked up to him a lot and the and and I believed in what he was teaching me because I saw the results. It wasn't like he was my hype man and then I was just doing this stuff with no results. I could see the results with the training partners that we had and then every now and then we'd get a blue belt or a purple belt. Purple belt and, and I'd been training less than a year and I'd tap a purple belt out. And it's like well, guess I'm a pearl belt. Or I'd go do a naga, and Cam would be like, "All right, dog, I'm still on a belt. And go li- like, do this first one at white belt because you're a white belt. All right, you win that. Next one, I would just put a blue belt on. Okay, tap everybody out in that. The next time, I put a purple belt on. All right, lost by neon belly. Okay, I'm purple belt. You know, like that. <laughs> I, clearly, looking back at it, like, are you an idiot? You know, like <laughs> that's how you like. That's how you ran your gra- grappling. Uh, you figured it out. Or, like, you'd go the distance with a black belt with under a year of training at, with the whole time being on the ground and none of it on the feet. And now, all of a sudden, you think that you're a black belt. Well, that's what Cam was saying. He's like, he's like, dog, you're like a purple belt. You know, you can go toe-to-toe with any black belt out there. And it's like, but I would believe it. And then i get out there. And, like, my, my mission was never to survive. It was I'm going to finish this guy, whether it was grappling or – or did, MMA. At what point in time do you start making up your own submissions? It was what was it, the sword and the stone? Yeah, yeah. Like we had that crazy mm-hmm. stuff. Like the the sword and the stone is the triangle, but the leg is inside. Hey man, I made something up last night. Yeah, and <laughs> like somehow you'd get a guy like he'd step in and you'd sw- you go for like a heel hook, and then he'd push your foot to the outside and squat his weight toward you, and then you'd just grab his head and throw the triangle up around his head, arm, and leg. And so since the leg was inside, I called it the sword and the stone. <laughs> I, mm-hmm. I don't know, man. And then Micah was making up things called That's the Pegasus. He's, grand master now. he's got his own moves. And <laughs> Micah had the Pegasus, and then we had this. I never knew about the Pegasus. We had a oh, we wow. had a we had a position that only occurred when me and Micah grappled. Yeah. And it was called Double Dragon. <laughs> and what page yeah. was that on? And, and, and Double Dragon would be if Micah had my if Micah had both hooks in. But I had Micah's back. 
So, so. <laughs> oh no, I do remember y'all he, doing this. Yeah. He's like, and we kept winding up there. Micah, and I was like, what is happening? Micah would have two hooks in, but his body would be off to the side, and I'd have a seat belt or harness <laughs> on Micah. So I'd have Micah's back, but he would have his hooks in on me. Like, <laughs> it's like, how do we? And then he, and then he would have it on me, or I would have it on him. But only me and him would end up in yeah. that position. Oh my God. Uh, was it just? Was it just the Pegasus and the Sword and Stone? Was there any other secret? underground moves any miller brother moves that we would mm. make up um, back in the old days i used to watch fights and people would yell out ken shamrock do the shamrock and the, you know they had that their own like the corner was yelling out moves so nobody would know the arm bar or whatever they would just make up stuff like that you know? we would end up in positions where like like with the way cam taught us was not to believe in techniques but to believe in like the principles and we'd be in a position where a guy might be almost past our guard, but we had one carotid block off. And so then I'd just drop my shin into his carotid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, but it was like it would choke them to where they would bail on the pass. Now, I was actually doing the move to try to finish them, but they they had some kind of application. So there, stuff like that would happen all the time, but not like a move I made up, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, you don't make moves up. You just discover them. Yeah. Because – you find that other people it's have kind of like organic have kind of like seen the <laughs> same thing, like you know, like people you've never trained with have, they're kind of discovering the same thing, you know, but you might not have known that they've, they made up the move, you know? Yeah. Um, you guys got anything else? <laughs> All right. So I think that, uh, next time, like tune in, stay tuned in. Um, the next time we do this, a film session, maybe we can get, uh, Micah, while he's here, we'll do the tournament that also happened on one of uh, Matt's shows. It was like SFO. <laughs> who is who is the the ring announcer? Rick the, Rick the, from ninety two. Didn't he go to prison? <laughs> didn't that guy go to prison? With the ring announcer, the guy with the ponytail, yeah. Rick. It was Rick from ninety two point three or some. Was he something. in Macon? Yeah, yeah. I used. It was to, a so famous was a radio guy, guy. Mark Bishop. It was a radio guy. A radio the radio voice. guy. He was a voice. He was a DJ. So that people one knew, point time I had people knew who he was. He was one. Um, From the bull or something. <laughs> <laughs> 92 the bull yeah, or always, something. Because I was like trying that. to harness them in because I figured if I had a DJ who was, he would, tomorrow night I'll be at the fights. And then I was like, okay, that's the ticket sold. Um, God knows. I know who you're talking about now. Rick the voice. Uh, Bubby would remember. Oh, he remembers everything. <laughs> did he go, what did he go to prison for? I don't know. I, don't, I, don't know. I, 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 I just think that he got, I think it was like a, a money. I might be completely wrong, but, and we haven't said his first or last name. So <laughs> he said Rick. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't say it. I didn't he say it. Yes. It's Rick. And he said Rick. Okay. I mean, <laughs> Google is your friend. Okay. We're, we're going to figure this out, but I, 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 I think, don't think he went to prison. <laughs> Allegedly. L legally, I'm going to say he did not. Okay. Maybe he didn't, <laughs> but. I want to say that there was an announcer for one of your shows that went to prison for like financial crimes or something like that. Like not, not bad stuff, but the guy, um, the guy that, that he's talking about, I know for a fact his roommate had gone to prison for something at one point in time. He had, he was growing something at the house or something, okay. some kind of issue like that. You know what? We're, we're going to get on top of this, but regardless, <laughs> okay. we are going to discuss, uh, the tournament so that Mike, 2003, the tournament that Micah fought in on, I think it was like your last show, the SFO 12. Um, the last SFO? Well, isn't that the one that you fought on? The last SFO? Didn't you do one after? That was the last show you ever put on? Uh, I banned everybody. The, the, one that were, the one where Micah fought twice, but they had to stitch him up in the back between? Yeah, where somebody pulled out of the four man, so it was just three man. <laughs> Regardless, it was a really cool event. And yeah. we're going to... We're, <laughs> It may, might not have been the last one. It might have still working on Rick. Yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> stay tuned. And uh, thanks for doing this, guys. Yeah. Not a problem.